one of those people that made my way to the US from India at the age of, I wanna say 22. This was sort of mid to late 90s. At that time, I started in tech as a software engineer and then went back to business school. That sort of progressed into corporate venture capital. And then that sort of progressed into more and more into the venture ecosystem, you know, as a venture allocator uh, now at Churchill Asset Management. For Churchill, how much of your assets under management are dedicated towards venture capital? And how much of that part is towards emerging managers? Churchill is about 50 odd billion in assets under management. Venture is relatively new. We have about 35 managers in our book. So we see two to 300 firms a year and we're very selective. So call it eight to 10% of the funds that we see we commit to. We tend not to be sector focused, especially, you know, seed and pre-seed. We think you're betting more on the founder. So what do you think the strategy should be for the pre-seed and seed managers in the current fundraising market? Be reasonable in terms of fund size and take your time deploying that capital. How is Churchill thinking about or how are you thinking about India? We're really excited about India. I've been hearing great things about India in different cities, including tier two cities. So our approach will be Hi, this is Siddharth Alwalia. Welcome to the Neon Show. I'm your host and also founder of Neon Fund, a B2B SaaS focused fund investing in the most enterprise SaaS companies coming out of India, building for the world. I'm super excited to have Raja Dodala on the Neon Show today. He's head of venture capital and growth equity at Churchill Asset Management. Raja, welcome to the Neon Show and so excited again to have you on the show. Thank you for having me, Siddharth. This is my, I think, the first podcast out of India. So thanks for the invite and thanks for having me. Uh, Raja, uh, would love, you know, before I introduce you to the background, but would love to hear from you, right? What's your background? What brought you to the US? And how did you came into Churchill? And then next set of questions would be from my end would be, what's Churchill's background, right? And uh, what's the broader industry that the firm operates in? Yeah. Um, Thanks for, again, thanks for having me. Uh, like everybody, you know, a lot of people in my generation, um, I'm one of those people that made my way to, to the U.S. from India at the age of, I want to say 22, 23. Um, and at that time, this was sort of mid to late 90s. Uh, you know, all the immig Indian immigrants. Um, at that time, I started in tech as a software engineer. I've done that a few, for a few years, um, then went back to business school and took an interest in starting businesses inside of large companies. And then, you know, that sort of progressed into uh, corporate venture capital, investing in startups on behalf of large corporations. And then that sort of progressed into more and more into the venture ecosystem, um, you know, as a venture allocator uh, now at Churchill Asset Management. And Churchill Asset Management is a, $50 billion AUM private capital asset manager. And Churchill's businesses are uh, private equity. We're an LP in uh, 300 odd private equity firms and largest uh, private credit provider in the US for middle market um, companies. And venture and growth equity um, is a, one of the businesses at Churchill that I manage. Um, our business at Churchill and Venture and Growth Equity is we are a, an investor in venture capital funds, primarily in the U.S. and a little bit um, internationally, but primarily in the U.S. And um, we, we not only invest um, in venture capital funds, but we also invest in startups directly alongside our venture capital partners. And uh, Raja, uh, if you have to explain the fund of fund ecosystem that you op operate in, Right. What's the broader ecosystem that that is there in the U.S.? Yeah, if you think about venture capital in the source of um, capital for the venture capital firms uh, going back to you know a few decades, uh, it's really started out as university endowments, primarily um, being the LPs, sort of in a way, uh, you know, really a catalyst for venture capital ecosystem to grow in the U.S. But over the years, really over the decades, that kind of evolved into now, if you look at a venture capital fund, um, their LPs, limited partners, these are investors in a venture capital fund, would be typically uh, university endowments or you know, there's other endowments that are not part of universities, but maybe healthcare institutions and large family offices. Um, and then sort of the newest entrant in that um, space of capital allocators to, to venture is fund of funds. And these are... Um, technically funds um, that invest in other funds. Um, it's sort of become 
a, a good source of capital for venture capital funds in that um, they provide a great service both for funds but also for investors. You know, if you're um, a, a large family office or even a, a pension plan that uh, do not have the expertise to source and underwrite uh, venture capital funds yourself, um, then a great way to get exposure to this asset class is to, um, in a diversified way, um, in to invest in a fund of funds that, uh, that they would source and underwrite and manage um, venture capital investments. And how old is the fund of fund ecosystem in the U.S.? As you mentioned, right, university em em endowments would go yeah. back investing in VCs approximately 40 years since the time of Apple. Probably, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, the fund of so there is a few that have been around 30 plus years, um, but not um, as many as endowments. But lately, you know, last 10 to 15 years, the business model has taken root uh, in the U.S. and also in internationally. There are a lot of successful, fairly large um, funds of funds now. And let's say, uh, in your in your opinion, right, who would be the top five funds of fund of funds on that list? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, in terms of size, um, probably Vencap. Um, uh, they, they've been around a long time. Um, there's one called Vintage uh, Investment Partners out of Tel Aviv. And oh, from forgetting the, the large US one, Stepstone um, is a large, uh, has a large fund of funds. Um, Sapphire Ventures has a, a, a sizable fund of funds, and, and then I'd put us in the you know sort of a, a somewhat um, a large um, AUM. Got it. And uh, how how the fund of funds have differentiated themselves from university endowments? It like you are more open to private capital of hundred of millionaires or billionaires want exposure to this asset class, whereas university endowments are typically. Uh, more reserved for those universities. Yeah, I think those are you know uh, slightly different purposes, right? Um, you know, funds of funds are in the in the business of um, sort of you know capital management on behalf of other LPs. Um, university endowments or a hospital endowment, they'll be investing the endowment of the institution. Um, you know, among other asset classes, they allocate yes. to, to venture in managing their own sort of capital. You know, for the purpose of you know preserving the institution for the long term. I think different purposes, but operate somewhat sure. similarly. Yeah, got it. And for our today's podcast, we are most focused on the venture capital part of it, right? The seed Series A exposure, and especially you know on the emerging manager side. So what according to you know Churchill's definition are emerging managers and not emerging managers and what are the categories of that? Yeah, it's a good question. I think everybody has a different definition of what they consider emerging managers. Uh, in, in, our, in our opinion, it's less about how many funds you've had, but we think it takes about you know, eight to 10 years um, for your portfolio strategy to sort of settle into one that uh, really designed to take advantage of whatever your strengths are as a manager. Um, and that happens to be you know, based on the, the, the so the timelines and, and pace of deployment over the last you know couple of decades, anywhere from eight to ten years, and two to three vintages, uh, assuming a two to three year deployment you know pace, um, you know we we've sort of has a as a, a rule of thumb um, fund three to four. Um, is when I think you 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 sort of trends start to emerge whether they they they've been good at sourcing and picking and helping companies that were no, you're no longer emerging. That's kind of our rule of thumb. Got it. And for Churchill Halik, how much of your assets under management are dedicated towards venture capital, and how much of that part is towards emerging managers? Yeah, so we're you know, church has about fifty, you know, odd billion in assets under uh, management. Um, venture is relatively new, um, so it's not significant. We're not disclosing the exact number, but we have um, uh, about thirty-five managers in our book, um, and it's fairly large um, in terms of, uh, relatively speaking, in the fund of funds um, ecosystem, um, but growing. We're allocating every year. Got it. So, so out of the three hundred. You have 35 VC funds uh, in, you know, where you are LPs in. And 270 are mostly sort of the nature of PEs. Yeah, the, th yeah, the, th the 280 to 300, that's, that's PE firms. Um, and uh, 35 or so venture firms. 
yeah and if you can share like some of the known names in venture that you are investors in yeah so the, i think the way we think about venture is we think there's two or three different products inside of venture um with sort of different risk profiles and different holding periods and and obviously the you know the returns and risk so seed and pre-seed we think is one product and series a through d which usually you know used to be you know classic venture capital um and then growth and sort of all the way to the ipo the sort of a third asset cl you know class we think the way we've uh, the, our, our approach to investing in venture is we primarily have stuck to the first two uh seed and pre-seed and in that sort of one set of managers and then you know series a through through d is another set so for series a through d we're somewhat concentrated eight to ten firms these are you know sort of platforms you know well-known sandhill you know road firms you know the, the usual suspects um and uh, that's sort of series a through d and for uh seed and pre-seed we've taken the approach of we think uh smaller managers are better suited um to invest in seed and pre-seed uh, we, you know, we have a long tail of 25, to, you know, ish, uh, firms in, in that, uh, and most of those we've added in the last sort of three years. Um, and the, when, when I, when I say small, we think anywhere from 25 to, to 125 million, um, that's sort of the range we think is suitable, best suited for uh pre seed and seed. Got it. So the current strategy is just for the audience, you know, repeating it, you have 25 firms, which are pre seed and seed where the f the fund sizes are from 25 million to 125 million and uh, then you have 8 to 10 funds which are series a funds which are typically called now growth Correct. funds multi and yeah well they're not i wouldn't say they're growth you know i don't want to confuse sort of the classic growth firms like you know co2 and you know etc so we're more class you know venture firms that are multi stage so series a through the i think first the entry point primarily is series a understood understood and and these are funds which are more than 125 million in size and maybe go up yeah there'll be billion. there'll be yeah yeah so, so sort of 500 to you know uh, two to three billion is is a range of those i mean there are some that are much larger than that um that are not quite a, a good fit for us uh for series a through d we sort of stuck to uh sort of 500 to two to three billion is a range and then we also layer in additional capital in directly into to startups um alongside our funds these are you know post product market fit sort of you know uh, you know uh, the cusp of you know scaling um uh you know sometimes series a you know a lot of times series b and c got it so uh, let's say a traditional let's say 100 million dollar family office uh which has to dedicate to a few fund of funds how how would they differentiate churchill among among the stepstones of the world yeah, so we have yet to take third-party capital. Um, we're currently investing our own capital uh, source of our uh, uh, for this strategy. The source of our capital is our uh, our nonprofit parent um, called TIAA. Um, it was, you know, founded hundred years ago uh, by Andrew Carnegie, uh, dedicated to financial wellness of um, educators and healthcare professionals that kind of work in nonprofits. Um, but in terms of, you know, with any, you know, fund of funds, um, I think that if you're an LP allocating to venture as part of your overall asset, you know, base, I think the thing to, to remember that's different about venture, um, from either even private equity is that, um, there's a lot of dispersion between the performance of top quartile and bottom quartile. Uh, not so much dispersion in private equity, but in venture. So the most important uh, thing to look for when you're selecting a manager, a fund of funds manager, as an LP, a family office, is do they do they have demonstrated access to top quartile, top decile managers, and uh, consistently, and are they able to get the allocation, the amount of allocation that they they would need to make their portfolio math work. And do they um, have access to um, co-investments alongside the funds? And the co-investments is a great way, sort of de-risked um, companies um, later on in the, in the life cycle, is a great way to not only shorten the J-curve a little bit, but also maybe um, a higher return. Um, because some, you know, a lot of the times co-investments tend to be 
lower in terms of fee uh, fee burden. So those are the two aspects that I would look for if I'm a family office. Um, do they have access to top firms? Are they able to get enough allocation? Um, and are they able to access co-investments? Those are the three things that I would look for. And is, is getting in access to the, let's say, A16s of the world, is, is it tough or light speed of the world? Is it tough in the in the yeah, AP world? Yeah, I mean, the, yeah, usually the top decile, top quartile, um, because I don't know the returns of those two firms you mentioned, um, but if you're, if you're a top quartile manager consistently, typically oversubscribe. And it's difficult to, to get um, access and especially enough um, of a, a chunk of that fund. Yeah. And let's say VCs, you know, demonstrate their value to entrepreneurs by providing go-to-market, by providing portfolio management teams. How do LPs or fund of funds provide their differentiation when competing for the top decile VC funds? Yeah, it's a really interesting in question. I think I, I, I'd, I'd put it in a couple of different ways. Um, typically, what's been um, sort of uh, touted as a, um, a desirable LP is two different uh, things that people, you know, VCs look for. One, um, how sticky is that capital? You know, is their uh, investment time horizon long enough? Because VC is a long asset class. So are they patient? Is that patient capital? And can we count on them as long as we're, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking from the perspective of a VC uh, firm, as long as we're performing according to sort of our promises, can we count on that LP capital long term? Um, that's, you know, that's important. And then two, um, are they uh, are, are they forward thinking enough? Because venture is investing in you know sort of you know new technologies. Sometimes there could be cycle you know technology cycles that you know go um, in, not, may not go according to plan. There may be a vintage um, that may not be top quartile. Are they understanding of um, the, sort of the patience in in understanding cycles? Um, and then the other, you know, sort of lately, you know, th there's the other aspect of, are they helpful? <laughs> Just like uh, founders look for how helpful the VCs are, are the LPs helpful? And the, the help from LPs could come in the form of, can they help uh, introduce us to other LPs as I'm raising my new funds? Um, can, can I count on them for uh, references? And, you know, I've been told uh, by some LPs that I'm somewhat of an N of one because I've been a software engineer myself and, and you know, I'm part, you know, we're a, a subsidiary of a large firm that's also a buyer of technology. Um, and we occasionally help portfolio companies of our funds um, even close contracts. Uh, so the help uh, can come in a number of d different ways. Um, but yes, I think it's a really an important question that's being asked these days. Um, well, what can you bring to the table besides capital? And what's your strategy and check size when you're operating in pre-seed and seed and when you're operating in A and Bs? Yeah, that's a good question. So for sort of the multi-stage firms, um, they tend to be large. Um, so that's, you know, sort of the, uh, I don't want to give you the exact number, but um, let me go back to seed and pre-seed first and then come back to the, to the A. For seed and pre-seed, the way we think about it um, is anywhere from 5 to 15% to of the fund size is sort of the, what we look for in terms of a check size, depending on our um, familiarity with the manager or experience with the manager and their track record. Um, and for Series A and B, um, that would that would be a rather large check. <laughs> so we wouldn't um, we wouldn't write that large of a check, but it's a sizable, um, uh, much larger than a, a check that we would write into a sure. seed or a pre-seed manager. And let's say for for putting money in twenty five pre-seed and seed funds, how many funds mm -hmm. you would have evaluated seriously? Uh, yeah, good question. So we seed two to three hundred firms a year. Um, and we're very selective. Um, so call it, you know, eight to 10% of the funds that we see, we commit to. And, and what's the process like? How, how many uh, months or years you like to evaluate them? What, what, definitely what is not, typically meets your, uh, yeah, definitely not, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> definitely not years. Definitely not years. Um, so, so we're, we're somewhat clear, um, about, uh, what we look for. And uh, we have a fairly, I, I sort of call it an open book test. We, we don't want to make it, um, we don't want to make it an opaque 
sort of black box kind of a process. We have a um, sort of well documented uh, questions that we we have we, we look for you know we look for answers to. Um, we openly share that with our managers, and um, you know usually um, if your data room is well organized, we're able to get most of it from the data room. Uh, and then we also, you know, check a lot of references. You know, we want to, uh, you know, see what your reputation is in the market, both from um, collaborating with other firms, but also what what the experience will be for a founder to work with you. Um, and if your data room does not have all the information, that we'll, you know, we'll, we'll get on the phone with you. And then we typically um, spend a lot of time with you in person. Um, we're one of those people that are somewhat old school <laughs> um, we, we like to see you where you work um, and your team and the team dynamic um, and we really get to know you as people especially seed and pre-seed managers you're underwriting um, as much as the track record but also you as people we're forecasting how you'll behave for the next 10 to you know a lot of cases 20 plus years and we're forecasting how um, you know what kind of decisions that you'll make we're forecasting how you'll evolve as a person, um, because when we bet when we bet on you, that fund will take ten to twelve years for it, for it to come back, and then another vintage. So you, we're talking about a multi-decade relationship. So when you're getting um, almost like getting married with, with a person for multi-decades, we want to spend time with you um, in person and get to know you. And what we say to our managers is that we set expectations very clearly. Um, we sort of, you know, we're a small team, even though it's a large AUM, we're not a large team, the underwriting team, especially. So we, we clearly communicate, we sort of have a monthly investment committee meeting and we will tell you whether you're proceeding to an investment committee process or not. When that happens, um, it's typically a three to six week process more, you know, uh, closer to three than six. Um, and we'll tell you when we start that process. And then at the end of that process, we'll tell you our decision. Got it. And typically, I assume this process would take, what, two to three months from the start of the first conversation? Probably. Yeah, I think if, if it's not a fit, we'll tell you immediately. Um, we're, we're able to rule out uh, strategy fit and, 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 and size fit and sector fit very quickly. Um, if we didn't rule you out in the first or second meeting, um, then, yeah, typically a two or three month process. Cool. And what are the vintages of these funds at pre-seed and seed that you come in, like the funds between 25 to 125? Do you usually coming in fund one, fund two, fund three, or fund four? Yeah, so uh, good question. Uh, we do do fund ones, not many. Um, we do a handful of fund ones. We think it's important to discover new managers and sort of bet on them when they're uh, before they uh, uh, they scale. Uh, but in you know, typically, you know, uh, fund ones and fund twos are uh, rare, but they do happen. But lots of fund threes, fours, and fives. Okay, I assume so. Uh, out of the twenty-five, roughly five to six would be fund one and twos, and twenty yeah. would be what fund threes yeah, and fours. Fund today. threes and fours, and a lot, a lot of fives too. But but don't you see uh, uh, the challenge there that between twenty-five to one twenty-five? The, the managers that are able to raise their fund three and four are able to scale beyond 125 million, probably raise like a 200 mil fund. Yeah, I, I think, th so some do and some don't. Um, some believe the right amount of capital uh, to, to, to produce better, you know, top tier re returns for a seed and pre-seed strategy. You know, some believe it's about, you know, the top end of that is like 125, maybe 150. And if you, you quote scale, um, beyond that size, you likely won't be part of our portfolio anymore. Um, we think, you know, especially seed and pre-seed is sort of a boutique business, and we don't think it should scale to hundreds of millions of dollars. So if you end up one of those people that would do that, we typically would opt out. Got it. And uh, following this strategy, right, between 25 to 125 million, the pre-seed and seed, what have been your geographical focus? I'm not even asking about the country focus, but if by country yeah. you have to spread by cities, what would they be? Yeah, that's a good question. So in the U.S., um, California still is the epicenter of the venture ecosystem. In our portfolio, we're in the U.S. So we're, so, so we're about 90% uh, U.S., 10% Israel. Um, and in the U.S., uh, predominantly, probably 70% um, California. Even in California, 
uh, out of the 70% that we have in California, probably 70% in the Bay Area, um, and maybe 30% in LA, an increasingly growing ecosystem. And then New York um, is probably 20 to 25%, and again, a growing ecosystem, and then a handful that are in different cities. And it's very important to maintain, it's very important to maintain that uh, and follow the trends as to, to where the, the, the best companies are um, getting founded and funded. And, and why do you think uh, the ratio is such right today? Yeah. Is it because the, the number of unicorns or the number of exits in these areas? It's the it's a network. It's 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 really a network effects um, sort of ecosystem. It's the you know it's the it's the it's the large companies. You know you know think about you know Meta and Google and and, and the Stanford and Berkeley. You know it's and it's it's a big sort of self um, sort of uh, reinforcing ecosystem of advice and capital and talent and universities and VC firms. So it, you know, lots of you know. Thankfully, lots of other cities are trying to grow that ecosystem, but it's still, especially these days, it's it's even growing. Um, especially with AI, it seems to be that the San Francisco Bay Area seems to be the epicenter of all the AI you know work uh, that's happening. Um, but I think that's even other countries are you know trying to sort of get this going, and it's 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 you know it's you know eventually it'll happen. But I think it's really hard to build that network. And what would be the sector split across these twenty-five funds? We we tend not to focus on sectors um, because we you know it's you know this is a sort of a you know time the time frame for a venture fund um, is sort of a three-year deployment period and then a ten-year, ten to twelve-year sort of uh, exit. So we we tend not to be sector focused, especially you know seed and pre-seed. We think you're you're betting more on the founder, um, you're underwriting the founder more than a thesis. Um, I mean, there are some that are sector-focused uh, seed and pre-seed funds. We haven't done those yet. Um, the ones that the only ones that we've been somewhat curious about lately, and we haven't done any, is sort of the defense and space, and in, you know, in newly um, renewed interest in industrialization of the U.S. Um, we've been studying that sector, but so far we've been mostly generalists, not sector-focused funds. And since you mentioned that you are not sector-focused, right? So would it be like your capital is spread more towards the generalist fund and not sector funds? Yeah, I would I would agree. Yeah, so what? So inter, it's interesting. Um, in the multi-stage firms, uh, these are Series A through D. These are you know large platforms. They they're technically generalists when you look at the whole fund, but within that, they have specialist partners. You know, one partner focuses on enterprise. One partner focuses on um, infrastructure, the other partner, you know, focuses on defense and fintech. So we like that in a sort of a platform, a series A, you know, firm where the firm can invest in, you know, most of the sectors that are part of the ecosystem, but they have people that have, you know, areas of interest and have credibility in that space, um, that they're a known commodity that because of that ex expertise that they see, you know, best of the deals. Seed and pre-seed, it's more of a you know, a person, <laughs> the manager, and their, you know, reputation, regardless of whatever the sector is. And they'll see some of the best um, founders, regardless of what they're working on. Got it. So, so if I have to summarize for our listeners and emerging managers who are listening, you prefer more sector agnostic funds than sector specific funds. Is that correct? I do. But I think, again, we tend not to be dogmatic, just like we, just like a seed manager uh, really is underwriting uh, the person. Um, and, and the idea uh, at the beginning, we're the same way. If we find a man, you know, a, a seed manager that we really, you know, everything else um, sort of checks out in our criteria, but that person happens to be running a sector focused fund. We're not going to say, oh, there's a box that, you know, there's no root, there's no sort of hard, you know, and we tend to be somewhat open minded, more focused on the manager versus the, the focus and the strategy of the, uh, of the fund. Yeah. Yeah. And you since so much uh, focused on the manager at pre-seed and seed rather than performance. So what are those qualities, you know? No, those are not mutually exclusive. Um, no, those yeah. are not, you know, the, the idea is that if we, the, the, the input, if we get the input right, I think at the end of the day, we're trying to build um, a top quartile, top decile sort of portfolio um, of funds and companies. So, 
you, we, who we think is going to be the best manager, you know, invariably the reason we think that way is because they're going to be producing top quartile, top decile performance. Yes. Yeah. And and let's say uh, uh, if you have to put some metrics to the performance, what would those metrics yeah. be for somebody? In yeah. So seed and seed yeah. Three and four. Yeah. So so let's say you're a, you're a seed and pre seed manager, and this is your fund one. Um, so there's not a whole lot of metrics in the in a fund format. But what we don't do is we don't invest in managers in fund one if they had no investing experience whatsoever. If this yes. is the first time they're writing a check, that would never even pass the first email to yeah. us. So in that case, what we'd look for is typically people had had a long either angel track record um, writing small checks into companies. And in a lot of cases, more cases than not, um, these are you know folks that had worked at other firms. Um, they have a track record from those firms that attributable to them. It just so happens that they're branching out and starting their own firms. So that's always useful. Um, so without either one of those, um, we wouldn't invest in a, in a first time fund. Now, if you're a fund two, um, you know even though it hasn't completely been resolved. You still have fund one. We can see how what kind of companies that you underwrote, and we can see graduation rates, which are really important. If you're a seed manager, you know uh, what's been the graduation rate to Series A. Um, if you're a pre-seed manager, what's been the graduation rate to seed, and who's in those syndicates? Who's marking you up, and are they quality investors? And um, what are the business metrics of underlying companies? Have they been progressing um, at a pace that's reasonable? And those are the different ways you can underwrite without a three to four fund track record. And in terms of um, funds with established track record, let's say your fund three, fund four, now you've had a few years, maybe a decade, 12, 13 years, then the classic metrics that we care about, there's not one that's more important than the other. Um, so in the, the three things that we look at is the IRR. You know, IRR is important in that the purpose of the IRR is if you're an asset manager that's allocating to multiple assets, then you have expectations for what the IRR is. IRR is a great way to compare one, you know, one, one portfolio to the other, one asset class to the other. Are you getting enough of a premium commensurate with the risk? That's the function of the IRR. Um, and also the time period. You know, if you're, you know, you know, the other metric that we, you know, classically care about is DPI, sort of cash on cash. Um, so typically 2.8 to 3 puts you in the top quartile, um, depending on the vintage. And some, some vintages it may not. Some vintages, you know, vintages it may put you in the top decile. So, um, so that's important. Uh, DPI is important. But also if you took 15 to 20 years to produce 3x, then that IRR is probably 8% yeah. or 10%. <laughs> so, so you yeah. have to look at both. And then yeah. if you haven't had any exits yet and there's not a lot of liquidity, then you know the TVPI. So these are this the unrealized, both realized and unrealized. Um, and and we also look at the quality of those markups if they're unrealized. Are they um, paper mark? For example, um, I think sixty percent of the unicorns that were marked up um, in in our 2021, 2022 are probably not going to ever realize um, their markups. Um, and so what is the quality of those markups um, and what are the fundamentals of the business? So it's not like one metric, but it's a combination of different metrics. Got it. And typically, uh, you know, because you, you have been uh, invested in a few decades in these asset classes, what are the underlying assets that have produced real DPI across these funds? Like any sectors uh, specifically, uh, uh, you know, which, which you have appreciated as LPs? Has it been yeah, consumer? I don't Has it been enterprise tech? Yeah, I think so. Enterprise is probably the you know so the most likely um, in terms of if you look at a normal distribution, the enterprise is probably the you know, the chunkier part of the the distribution. Um, and you know, outliers probably have been consumer, but those are really rare. You know, uh, you know, if you normalize it, you know, for the the entire population, outcome per. Um, exit probably a lot of really really small for in the consumer, um, but the ones that do produce are tend to be outliers. So we tend to favor, um, you know, enterprise uh, because it's you know I looked at some data, the exit data for the last twenty five or thirty years, um, median outcome is about ninety million, believe it or not, 
Um, obviously there's outliers, you know, top, you know, there's like 20, 30 billion, but, uh, median outlier, medium outcome is about 90 million, sort of 80 to, to 300 is sort of the most likely outcome. And those tend to be enterprise companies. Got it. And, and why do you think so that that's the case? Um, I don't know. I don't know why, but it's really hard to, uh, create a company that's worth enduring and that's worth multiple billions of dollars. I mean, if you look at all the public companies in the U.S. today, um, companies that are worth more than a billion is about 300 companies. That's it. So it's really difficult to, 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 to produce a company that's worth in more than a billion and, and that will continue to be worth more than a billion. Um, it's just, that's the way the, the laws of capitalism works. <laughs> so, uh, so the, so most likely outcome would be sort of a two to $300 million outcome, which is why, which is why I think the fund size is important. So if you have a billion, you know, I don't know if you have a $500 million seed fund to do a three X net, um, so that means you have to produce, um, two to $3 billion worth of total outcomes, which is very difficult to do. Yes. Which means that even at the the best case scenario is at the at the end of your ownership cycle, you are holding ten percent in across each of your winners. Your winners need to be combined twenty thirty billion dollars in size, which has correct, which is unrealistic. And that's very unlikely to do. So that's why if you're a fifty million dollar seed fund to do a three x, you have to produce a total of maybe two hundred and twenty million in total outcomes. There's a number of ways to do that, and they have a lot lot more optionality in their outcomes than a large fund. And what are the number of portfolio companies that 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 you have preferred in your pre-seed and seed funds per fund? Yeah, I think there's there's not one way to do that. I think we've we've thought about that a lot. Um, some say you know they prefer lots of shots at goal, where they'll have you know 60, 70, 80 companies, and they you know have very little if 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 anything in in the form of reserves for a follow-on. Some have it's a completely opposite approach where they'll do 12 companies and there are super high yeah. conviction bets and high ownership. Um, risky, but also, you know, in, if that is their strategy and they're, they're able to produce the returns based on that strategy and they're able to get ownership in, in great companies that can work too. Um, but the most common we see is sort of 20 to 30 companies, maybe 40, um, and 30 to 40% uh, reserves follow-ons for pro rata. That's the most common thing that we see. But what we tend to do is when we, when we think a manager and their values and their sort of judgment and their reputation um, sort of checks out, we tend to be open-minded and be tolerant of different strategies inside of a fund. And in, in your portfolio, you are saying that in your pre-seed and seed, most of the funds would have between, let's say, on an average, 30 to 40 companies? Yeah, 25 to 40 is the, the most common size we see. Yeah. And if you have to compare your set of pre-seed and seed managers, what dip differentiates the top from the rest? Yeah, it, it, I think it's the age, yeah, it's the age old question. Um, but at the end of the day, um, you know, are you, do you, there, what is your unique, I don't, you know, I don't want to be corny, but what is your superpower? Um, are you, um, are you someone who is well respected in a narrow field of data and open source? I'm just going to pick, you know, just yeah. picking that as an example. Um, you're well known in that community, and you're likely to see not all, but most of the you know great projects and 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 and, and precede companies in that area. Um, are they going to come to you, and are they going to accept? Uh, sort of your check where your um, your contribution is not just capital. It's something that you add to the table. Um, and are you going to get meaningful ownership? Um, that seems to be the biggest predictor. And the second is um, when you're a pre-seed and seed manager, are you, are you resilient? Do you have the patience to stick with that man, you know, that company for 10 to 12, sometimes 15 years? Are you able to, you know, it's, it's, it's a really hard work and it's a long process. And do you have the patience and do you have the wherewithal to help them? And, um, and and third is, are you able to get them to graduation? Are you able to introduce them to quality Series A uh, lead? Um, and then you know, maybe introduce them to some customers early on. So th those are sort of the leading indicators of what makes a seed manager great. 
and we look for those and they're somewhat qualitative um and, and, but uh what we like to do is to we like to be right more times than not got it uh, uh speaking of you know current macroeconomic challenges right uh how, how do you think the fundraising environment is for both the larger set of the funds that you operate in that are series a and b's and the, the smaller pre-seed and seed funds yeah no there's no doubt um that the fundraising environment um has become tighter um but i would say we're sort of back to normal um we we think sort of the 2020 to 2022 uh, maybe even 2018 2019 to 2022 sort of three to four year period um sort of an, an anomaly uh where people just you know uh, everything was getting marked up is <laughs> sort of a venture uh you know treadmill that it, you know assembly line that everything you know everything was getting marked up without a whole lot of um proof and uh, everybody, everybody was raising funds. I think at the peak, there was like 7,000 venture funds. Maybe I'm getting that number <laughs> wrong. Three, you know, thousands of venture yeah. funds, a lot more than the ecosystem can really bear. And even the ones that are established have, you know, raised uh, a fund every 18 months and some of them every year in multi-billion dollar funds. That time is definitely gone. I, you know, it may come back. You never know. Um, but now the the power dynamic definitely shifted um from the founder to the to the fund and fund to the vc but the 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 trend that i welcome the most is um is that we're back to sort of process wise a more reasonable process to underwrite both underwriting companies and underwriting funds um and i've been hearing anecdotally i don't have the data in front of me but um the graduation rate from fund 1 to fund 2 apparently is at the lowest and fund two to four is even lowest, which is, I think is healthy. I think we're normalizing um, back to sort of normal. Um, as an allocator um, to, to VC, we think that it's, this is a great time to allocate because of sort of more reasonableness in terms of process and timelines and fund sizes. Um, but even, even the larger firms um, have been, um, I mean, I wouldn't say they're having a tougher time, but definitely not as easy as it was in like 21 and 22. So what, so what do you think, you know, uh, the strategy should be for the, the pre-seed and seed managers in the current fundraising market? Um, I don't know that I have a, a whole lot of concrete advice. I think the, the, the only thing I would say is um, be reasonable in terms of fund size. I think, you know, the smaller, you know, you, you got to decide what is your minimum viable fund strat, you know, fund sizes, meaning... What is the minimum amount of capital that you need to get um, reasonable amount of ownership in quality number of you know quality companies and number of companies that you think you need? That's fifteen, depending on your strategy. Twenty companies, whatever. Um, and if you think it's fifty, maybe think slow. <laughs> maybe think it's you know lower. Uh, the lower the fund size, especially in this environment, uh, the lower the fund size, the more the optionality is in the fund to create a three to four x outcome. And um, and take your time um, deploying that capital, and also expect to spend. You know, I'd be hearing anywhere from nine to twelve months fundraising, um, but knowing that it's going to take that long, what I would do is get to your first close as quickly as you can, um, and don't wait until you get to a big number for the first close. If you are raising a thirty million dollar fund, and if you have a line of sight into ten million have a first close, start writing some checks so that the, you know, the LPs that are still evaluating you can get a sense of the kind of companies that you're able to access and the kind of ownership that you're able to, to, to get. It's easier to show them than tell them what your strategy is. Got it, got it. And uh, right now in this environment, uh, let's say, uh, how many funds uh, have you seen closing down or pausing on the next fundraise? Has it happened? With your existing I think it has also? not in our book but um, but I've seen some anecdotal data you know o- online that um, the mortality rate from fund one to fund two is like you know I think we, we went from seven thousand or so active I forget the number is it three thousand or seven thousand active funds to more like fifteen hundred so okay. that tells me that a lot of funds either have decided not to to raise their next fund. 
um, or they are unable to raise. Um, but I'm also seeing the opposite. There's a lot of new fund announcements, people that are branching out from, you know, you know, reputable firms and starting out and doing, you know, starting their own funds. I've been seeing that as well. You mentioned earlier about data room. What does a good data room look like to you? Yeah, so we, you know, we sort of have a, you know, we decided to write that down and share that with <laughs> with managers. Um, a good data room, um, like, you know, depending on how many funds you have, will have um, clear. Uh, first thing that we look for when when, when we uh, get invited, you know, invited into a data room or we we get introduced to a manager, what are the top line return numbers? Um, you know, your IRR. Your number of companies, you know, the, the the fund size, you know, vintage number of companies in the fund, current um, realized and unrealized value, net of fees. A lot of people don't break that out, which is really annoying. That's usually a bad sign when you have gross <laughs> IRR and gross TVPI versus net. Um, make it very very easy to find those because a lot of LPs, um, you know, especially LPs like us. We're trying to target top quartile if you have a track record then if we're not able to determine whether you're top quartile or not or it's very difficult to get that from your data room then you know your your first contact with an lp is an unpleasant one so i would make sure you have that and then once you pass through that gate what we like to see is the quality of the portfolios that means what are the companies underneath uh, in the portfolio and how are they doing their financials are they are they making progress what are the customer concentration um, you know, and then, you know, pipeline of your businesses. And if they're close to profitability, what is the runway uh, to profitability? And who are in the syndicates, who are the co-investors and who are the references? Um, so it's, it's, it's the, it's not rocket science, but I think the, the easier you make it to define this information, the quicker and easier your underwriting process will be. Got it. Got it. And any common mistakes that you have seen uh, the pre-seed and seed funds make in their data rooms that you would like to highlight? Yeah, the most common one, the most one of my pet peeves is make it really hard to find your top line performance um, <laughs> where we have to, you know, put it in Excel and calculate it. That that, that would that would really create a bad impression. Um, and gross versus net. Um, gross is meaningless uh, to LPs. You have yeah. to have net, uh, net of fees. Yeah. And also, um, you know, what are your fund drivers? Um, a lot of times it's not obvious what are, you know, you have 25 companies in a, uh, in a fund, what are the, you know, what are the five or 10 that are really driving, uh, your markup, your, your, your IRR, your TVPI, make it super easy to find that. A lot of times they make it really hard to find that. <laughs> Got it. And, and now to the most exciting part of a conversation, how is Churchill thinking about, or how are you thinking about India? Yeah, so India is so we the way we think about you know geographies is we we like to really under, do the work, show up on the ground, um, understand the ecosystem, understand the the, the managers, um, and understand the syndicates and the exit environment and the founder quality um, and you know just like we were very deliberate in the U.S. about you know, geographical concentration, like 70% California, you know, versus 25% New York. What are those uh, sort of dynamics um, in that ecosystem? So there's a lot of things that we um, sort of need to understand before we go into a market. Um, we haven't done that work in India yet, but India, you know, uh, obviously I have, you know, it's near to my heart. Uh, it's a place of my birth and India is ascendant um uh, you know on the world stage um you know the tech has always been a strength of india but it was sort of you know transitioning slowly from services based um sort of economy into more innovation you know i've been hearing great things about india in different cities including tier 2 cities so our approach will be we're really excited about india um but we definitely need to show up and and get to know people and get to know the ecosystem before we invest cool. so i i can think this Maybe you'll cut your first check in twenty thirty. You are six years away. <laughs> no, no, no. It, it'll be sooner than that. Um, uh, you know, it usually takes about a year for us to, to 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 get to know an ecosystem. So we hope to to do that work soon. Um, and I think one thing that I'm trying to learn um, about India is uh, the liquidity. You know, a, you know, the, the the story again. These this is probably an unfair story because it's sort of very anecdotal. 
is lots of great companies. Liquidity has been slower um, in the Indian ecosystem. I think that's in the process of changing. Um, and, and, but that's one area that I'd like to, to, to learn more about. Yeah. So would you follow your same strategy as in the US uh, in venture that pick up approximately 25 managers between 25 to 125 million and then pick up 10 managers on the growth stage in India? No, I don't know that we would replicate. So we don't. So we think of we think of a geography as a variable in our overall ecosystem. Um, we wouldn't replicate the same portfolio approach in an, in an ecosystem on its own. So we would sort of think about what weight uh, in the portfolio does India um, sort of uh, deserve um, based on our current strategy, and within that, um, do, you know, maybe we think about seed versus growth, but we wouldn't have the same numbers. Um, so the, the proportion of India in the overall portfolio will sort of grow over time. I think we'll probably start with a couple of managers and then we'll, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get to know the ecosystem and then we'll gradually increase that. That's kind of, you know, based on how it, it, it's going, you know, um, in other geographies that we entered, that's kind of how it will go. And, and let's say if somebody has to, uh, think about your strat what strategy in your would be going to be in India, like what was your strategy in Israel? When you opened up in Israel, was it three seed seed versus growth? What, how much were the fund sizes that you backed? And how yeah, many we funds did you back? we sort of stuck to so we sort of stuck to smaller um, fund sizes, and we sort of uh, we had both uh, with seed and uh, sort of Series A. So pre seed through Series A is kind of what we did. Um, we weren't very deliberate about the the the, the stage focus, more about um, the people. Um, again, we, we go back to underwriting people versus uh, the strategy. <laughs> so we underwrote yeah. people that we thought were um, simpatico with the way we think about investing, and we invested in those. And we, again, what 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 what? Who are they? What are you know? What are their strengths? What is their superpower? Is the fund strategy aligned with their superpower? Um, we haven't bet any bet any emerging managers there. These are established managers. You know, have they had a great track record? Got it. So these are managers, and how many managers would you have backed in Israel? We have uh, four. Okay, and I assume all of these managers would then be in their eighth to tenth year when you back them. Yeah, some longer. Yeah. Got it. So, so, so I think if you are entering a new market, uh, I would say that can be a proxy strategy. For example, for India, I, I don't know. I I'd be open minded about that. So I I wouldn't know what the strategy is until I you know sort of learn the ecosystem. But that, but that's a generally risk you know on a risk adjusted basis a thoughtful approach. But I wouldn't rule out earlier. I mean, it's you know, every geography is different. Um, I mean, they you know, India is not as you know farther along, um, you know yet. I think it, it's at the cusp of you know breaking out. So I don't know that a strategy in Israel would work in India. So we yeah. would be open-minded about how we would approach India. And, and one last question, you know, before I dive into the next section, right? Uh, how do you think about the public markets in India versus public markets in the U.S.? Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, public markets in the U.S. have been, um, I mean, some people say they're closed, they're not. Um, it's just the criteria for, you know, what a successful IPO candidate um, has been changing and moving around. So, uh, you know, we've sort of had probably the longest period of, um, you, know, liqu you know, lack of liquidity <laughs> <Drought. laughs> for private, privates in the, in the U.S. But I've been lately hearing the opposite um, in India that, um, you know, if you have a, a software company that's uh, you know, seven, you know, 50 to $100 million in ARR, and growing at a healthy clip and on the way to profitability, um, you know, uh, I saw a tweet the other day um, that From said, Gokul uh, well, he, "Yeah, Gokul." <laughs> <clears throat> so we we know Gokul well, and and he, he thinks it may be a better place to. You know, one question I would have again, I, I don't know this. I need to learn. Is that you know, uh, what is the situation in terms of like repatriation of capital? You know, uh, your returns back. So that may be a, a question that we you know, need to learn. But, but it's an really interesting thought from Gokul that um, India might be a better place for software IPOs than the U.S. Got it. And on, on, on your personal side, right, you are interested in, I think, cycling, running. I am. Keeps you Not running. 
not running. Uh, you know, I, I've had a, uh, I used to run, then I had a bit of a, a cycling accident a few years ago. And from then I, I stopped running. I, I strictly just cycling is, is, is my, uh, my sport. <laughs> Right. So, 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 uh, any form of cycling that you like specifically? Yeah, I, I, uh, I used to do road and mountain, um, you know, biking and, and lately it's more road than anything else. Um, but recently I've gotten into, I've got a new gravel bike. That's sort of a new, new trend here in the U S and Europe. And, um, it, it's, you know, tend to be a lot more fun a uh, lot more a lot safer because you're not on you're not out in the uh, on the roads in in the in traffic so i've been doing more uh, gravel lately but you know historically been more more road cycling awesome thank you so much raja it's been an amazing conversation today i learned a lot and i hope my listeners learned a lot right thank you so much for the amazing insights sharing your journey sharing churchill's journey and especially your thoughts on you know what are you looking for in emerging managers um well first of all thanks for thanks for reaching out and, and 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 inviting me on the podcast and i've been impressed with uh sort of the roster of guests in what i liked about your podcast is that you have um your interests are wide and really you know thought-provoking conversations you know from people in investing people in government and in the, the broader economy so i've been you know i've learned a lot from your podcast as well thank you so much again for being on the neon show thank you <laughs>